Uh, welcome to Remix's third webinar on COVID-19 transportation policy series. I'm Rachel Zach, Policy Director at Remix, a single platform that enables cities to see their mobility data in one place, plan a holistic network, and coordinate across stakeholders. We're hosting this webinar from San Francisco where we are sheltering in place and working virtually. Uh, so we leave our homes for essential items only. We are deeply saddened by the impact of this pandemic to our own transport services, such as Muni and BART, whose uh, ridership has been down 90%, as well as the impact to agencies across the US and the 300 plus transportation agencies supported by our software across the globe. Um, we will talk about uh, this today. We're gonna get really deep on it. Uh, so alarmed by what we were seeing, we started this series to make sure our global community of operators has direct access for new, to new information as it comes out, as well as, as, well as has a forum for sharing uh, the, what they are experiencing uh, as quickly as possible. So um, the format of the series today will be 30 minutes of conversation between me and today's guest, Jarrett Walker, followed by 15 minutes of time where we respond to questions from the audience. Um, as these questions occur during your talk, please submit your questions through the Q&A box. This way they'll be recorded uh, and we can make sure that they get answered. We have a special request to keep the questions on fixed route transit. We are trying to make sure that today's speaker speaks to his uh, expertise. Um, and we will have, um, we've had conversations about policy uh, in previous webinars and in the future we're sitting down with transit center. So just keep that in mind in terms of what you ask today. Um, so as I mentioned, and as I'm sure you're feeling, conditions are changing rapidly. And many of you might have information you'd like to share with your peers on how your agency is responding and the conditions uh, you've had to make in light of, or the other considerations you've had to make in light of the emergency and nature of the COVID-19 public health policies. Mm -hmm. we, ensure, uh, we encourage you to share an update now or, or during the talk in the chat box. So that will be shared publicly um, across different, um, uh, so that you can all see it. And, um, and then the, the other thing we're kind of trying out, although I'm seeing that there are just so many attendees, so we might not be able to do it today, um, is the ability to raise your hand and actually share an update, but that will be in the, the latter 15 minutes. So today's guest, enough about me, <laughs> today's guest is one of uh, the most knowledgeable people in the US on transportation service planning for fixed route transit. He is the author of Human Transit, the book uh, and the blog under the same name. Uh, he is the president of his firm, Jarrett Walker and Associates. Probably doesn't really need this introduction. Um, I wouldn't be overreaching to say he has had a hand um, in many of your agency planning across the country. Um, he's also a Remix user and was very influential to our software development. Uh, we love you, Jarrett. Welcome. Welcome to uh, the webinar today. We love you too, Rachel. <laughs> um, so let's dive right in. Um, so uh, our friends at Transit App are tracking demand, the demand drop from their users, which I think illustrates the magnitude of impact of these public health policies like shelter in place and social distancing on transit ridership. Um, and, and you can see in the, in the screen share just how dramatically this is occurring across all, uh, the nation. So what happens when a transit agency is faced with this type of abrupt decline and what types of decisions are they facing? Um, <clears throat> I realize that the transit agency, transit isn't unusual in this respect, but it's horrific. Um, it's catastrophic. Um, let's just understand what happens to a transit agency budget. First of all, the bigger transit agencies in particular get quite a bit of their revenue from fares. Um, some of the big subway systems are, way, are, over, are typically over 50%. Uh, many big city bus systems are 20, 30, 40% fare revenue. So what that means, all that revenue is gone, right? The, the ridership is pretty much gone and what is, um, um, and 
So all that fair revenue has disappeared. Some agencies, of course, are also offering free fares as a way of enabling people to board the rear door for social distancing purposes. That's to protect the drivers fundamentally. Um, <clears throat> So with all that happening, there's basically suddenly no fair revenue. That's suddenly 20, 30, 40, 50, or more percent of the budget gone. Then where does the rest of transit's budget come from? Well, it's mostly from local tax sources. Um, unfortunately, you know, some parts of government get to run on property taxes, which are extremely stable, um, but transit gets to run on sales taxes and payroll taxes for the most part, which are extremely volatile. People lose their jobs. Payroll tax goes down. Uh, payroll shrink, payroll tax goes down. People lose their jobs. They stop spending as much money. Sales tax goes down. And the other thing that's happening right now is that suddenly we're all shopping online and not every local government uh, has been able, you know, um, there's been a lot of work on this, but not every local government has been able to get sales tax money all the way back to the, to the location of the buyer uh, for, for special governments like transit agencies. It's terrible. So, um, that's, there really is no part of the transit agency's income stream that is not, can, that is not likely to collapse at this point. Um, yeah, so in terms of that, what, <laughs> yeah, like, sorry, that's really overwhelming. Um, what types of de decisions do they face uh, looking at this future? Um, the most immediate thing that's happening is that, um, they are being expected to do everything they can to address the immediate public health emergency, which they're being told is a higher priority than balancing their budget or keeping the lights on. So um, the huge uh, cleaning and disinfecting programs that are happening are expensive. The, um, uh, the social distancing that is causing them, for example, to protect their drivers um, uh, boarding through the rear door, that's expensive, you've given up fair revenue. Um, running large vehicle, running large buses and trains solely in order to provide social distance is expensive. Um, and you know, all of those things are happening now. And so at the same time that these expensive obligations, and I'm not saying that the transit agencies shouldn't be doing those things, it's just we need to recognize why they're doing them. Um, they're doing them for a public health reason, not because it's for good for ridership or good for their bottom line. Um, the, uh, um, because of that, um, they are looking at their budgets and wondering how long they're going to be able to keep the lights on, wondering how long they're going to be able to function. And so that's what's driving, two things are driving now the service cuts that we're seeing actually. One is just agencies looking ahead to their budgets and trying to figure out how to reduce their costs to the point that they don't just collapse. And the other is that um, many agencies are having trouble getting enough people to come to work. Understandably, you've got drivers who are, um, you know, having sniffles and coughs. You have drivers who are actually clearly sick. Um, and then you just have lots of drivers who, for whatever reason, are, um, you know, would prefer not to expose themselves and feel like they don't need the money that badly. So, you know, they're taking vacation time mm. and things like that. And so suddenly it's very hard to staff. So both of those things are converging to drive these service cuts. Now, the interesting thing, <clears throat> that comes up now is, okay, how do you cut service? How do you cut service in a way that minimizes the damage? And again, the primary uh, imperative that the transit agencies are operating under is to keep the essential services going. Um, we need, the person who is, who is bagging your groceries and taking them out to the curb for you may very well, very well needed to get to work on transit. The nurse uh, uh, who's trying to save lives at the hospital, very well needed transit to get there. So, um, you know, we have a real societal breakdown and a breakdown in essential services if transit doesn't keep running to provide that access. So for that reason, um, and, and also, you know, what we've seen in the ridership is very interesting, which is that ridership has utterly collapsed on commute-oriented services oh. for us in the laptop set, you know, who, who you know, for folks in the laptop set who only ride transit at 9 a.m. and 5 p.m. and are riding an express bus in from the suburbs. Those have just dropped practically to zero in many cases. Mm -hmm. And so those are quite sensibly among the first things that transit agencies have cut because there's no point really in trying to compete with the private car right now. Right now, there's no traffic, there's plenty of parking, and 
understandably, people are seeing their cars as a safer environment in terms of protection from the virus than public transit is. I can't argue with that right now. Mm -hmm. So um, services that are trying to compete with driving are pretty much um, collapsing. The other kinds of service where ridership is collapsing is anything remotely tourist or recreational oriented, because of course nobody's doing that. So what remains, and the thing that you know, I'm hoping that agencies can save as much as possible, is that all day, all the time, everywhere to everywhere, local fixed route network, bus and rail, um, that is there so that the to to make to keep the all of the essential functions of the city going. Remember, as what we think of as essential functions of the city are overwhelmingly low wage jobs. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly. Um, these are not going to be people who can necessarily afford to have cars, afford to drive. Um, so public transit has to be there as part of the essential service. And that's what they're looking at. And so transit agencies are now dealing, as, as always, with conflicting expectations. Is this a business or is it a social service? It's another example of the same crazy contradictory direction that we give transit agencies all the time. Um, and they're both, and someone has to balance these competing goals because they lead in opposite directions. The, um, the service cuts that we're seeing now, you know, when transit agencies have to go beyond cutting the peak and cutting the, the recreational stuff, they start going to uh, reducing frequencies. Many transit agencies are running a Saturday or Sunday schedule on weekdays now. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I think more alarmingly, uh, some transit agencies are starting to cut span, cut overnight service. Uh, those are more worrisome because there you do have people with no alternatives who are potentially stranded by those cuts. The frequency reductions are no small matter either. Uh, frequency reductions mean that connections on which the network relies stop functioning, you know, mm. that a transfer yeah. that you could make in seven minutes suddenly becomes 27 minutes. And um, that is that can very quickly turn into making the trip non-viable for somebody who has to actually get to work. Mm. So you know, I, I've been encouraging from the beginning, by all means, cut those Peak Express services, by all means, cut recreational services. Turn frequencies down to 15, but be very careful about turning 15s down to 30 or 30s down to 60, because then things just not start not functioning. Of course, what transit agencies have, for the most part, they have a Saturday and Sunday schedule built, so they tend to switch to that. Um, with a few exceptions like Houston, where I'm proud to have worked, where the Saturday and Sunday schedule is basically identical to weekday without the peak. Um, most transit agencies still have pretty dismal Saturday and Sunday levels of service. And in many cases, Saturday and Sunday schedules are already built in ways that provide very um, poor connection opportunities and make trips take a lot longer be just because of the lower frequency. I guess the last thing I'd mention is station closures. Um, we're seeing exceptional station closures uh, in the DC area. I haven't seen as many anywhere else. Um, that's tied to such practical things as shortages of cleaning equipment and shortages of staff. But again, there where you have a network that is built around connections, there are a whole bunch of bus services that feed into a particular station. And if you close that station, the network doesn't work anymore. So um, I think what I wanna say is I'm extremely sympathetic to what transit managers are dealing with right now. They're running on the fly. They're making policy as they go. They're making, I think, mostly good decisions. Um, but they understand that a lot of damage is being done and they don't see the other side of this for the most part any more than any of the rest of us do. Wow, yeah. So what I'm hearing are just the juggling of a lot of different decisions and you, um, you mentioned sort of where to start and what are the next layer of considerations and what are the final layer of considerations. If you had to just like stack rank them um, just clearly for us right now in summary, what are the first things people should consider second and third? The first things transit agencies should consider is um, getting rid of peak services that are really driven by nine to five demand because that's gone. Mm -hmm. What's left is all day demand. What's left is people who work at the grocery store, people who work at the hospital people who work in all those kinds of businesses, who were always there and who were always the foundation, you know, one of the foundations of all day transit ridership, but now they're what's left. And so I don't think there's any reason to have any peaking in any transit agency at this point. Um, and so, and of course, going to Saturdays and Sunday schedules is a way of doing that. Um, I think that um, step two, 
is to cut frequencies to 15 where you have very rich frequencies, but, but to do everything you can to keep from cutting, from cutting you further. Because that's when connections start to fall apart and that's when travel times really blow out and become unrealistic. That's the second thing. Um, I think the third thing is to look seriously at fares and whether the, pit, the pitiful amount of fare revenue that you're still going to get at this point is worth the hassles of collection and the hassles of fare enforcement. Now, I don't want to make that sound easy. Um, I talked with one, uh, I know of a couple of transit or, uh, agencies in the South where the homeless shelters have closed. They've thrown all the homeless people on the street. Well, the homeless people could charge their cell phones in the homeless shelter. Now the only people that place they can charge their cell phones is on the bus. So they're on the bus. And of course, when the weather's bad, you know, the bus becomes a roaming homeless shelter. And if you've closed the homeless shelter, you can't really blame them. So, you know, all this stuff is happening now. And, and notice too, all the ways that, you know, other organizations can dump their problems on the transit agency. You know, we closed the homeless shelter. So now we've got homeless people riding the bus around because that's the only place they can get Wi-Fi. Yeah. Well, I think there's a sort of theme that keeps coming up ar around sort of the expectations for transit um, and sort of it's one of them being ridership and the other one being this full-time sort of cure-all to make sure that we can still get essential workers to where they need to be. Um, I've also noticed on your blog this sort of like the problem with focusing so much on ridership. Do you want to talk a little bit about um, sort of narratives around ridership and, and what this moment is kind of showing? Absolutely. This is, I think, and you know, what Barack Obama would call a teachable moment. It's an extraordinary moment to reset the conversation about transit and to really grab our journalist friends by the lapels and say, look, look at what's happening, understand what's happening. We've got to stop talking about ridership as though it is the primary data point for evaluating how transit's doing, which is what most journalists have been doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for years now, we've seen journalists writing stories about transit ridership going down as though that's evidence either that transit agencies are doing something wrong uh, or that transit is becoming less relevant and, you know, therefore is something we won't need anymore. Both of those things are wrong. Um, but the first thing you have to understand is that right now, all over the country, transit agencies are proving that ridership is not the point. Because if ridership were the point, they'd have done what the airlines have done, which is to cut things to ribbons. You know, when airlines are seeing a 90% drop in ridership and they're cutting service to the point of almost 90%, transit agencies are seeing a 90% drop in ridership and cutting service 30%, right? Mm -hmm. Because they have an obligation to the community that an airline doesn't have. And so the whole, every time I see a, a, a story about, you know, how transit ridership is going, that is framed in a way that allows the reader to think that transit is a failing business. I think that's something we all have to learn how to confront now. It's a, it's a, it's a completely understandable mistake that a journalist makes when they just approach transit and they, they haven't thought about it that much and they assume that the business metrics like that are the metrics that matter. But right now, we all know that transit is essential infrastructure. Transit is why there, is, there, is, there are people at the hospital to, to save lives. Transit is why there is somebody, um, you know, you know there, there is somebody to, bag, to, to, to work at the grocery store. But that's always been true. <laughs> yeah. It's always been true that that's one of the fundamental functions of transit. And, um, and it's only now that we have this moment where ridership is clearly not the point. We have to remember and we have to help our journalist friends recognize that when you write stories about transit ridership going up and down, although as though that's a story about whether transit is more or less relevant or more or less successful, that's just not true. And yeah. we know that now. We can see that. Yeah. I'll make a pitch. I'll make a pitch here. You can Google an article of ours called the ridership coverage trade-off, um, which uh, it's at humantransit.org, where I lay out, you know, what I've been working on for a couple of decades now, which is just helping transit agency policymakers and boards understand that the ridership goals of transit and the kind of leave no one behind goals of transit are just mathematically opposite and lead to opposite kinds of network. And that therefore um, a, responsible, a responsible public conversation has to actually think about that question 
and uh, balance those competing goals and choose how to balance those competing goals. And for years, we've been running in our projects um, public conversations that really focus people on that question and make sure they understand that they cannot simultaneously demand high ridership and demand that we keep that bus with three people on it because those three people really need it. And yet transit agencies are constantly being told to do both of those things. So yeah. this is something we've been dealing with for a long time, but I think this is a moment when it's just suddenly undeniable that transit has a purpose other than ridership. And that's the only reason transit's doing what it's doing now. Yes, I think that is so right. Um, and we've definitely seen that kind of vote of confidence from our Congress recently that um, understanding that we're between a rock and a hard place and that we have a role, a big role to play in delivering workers right now. Um, I know uh, agencies are being really innovative and trying to figure out how to carry on this work while their employees are remote. You've been involved um, in this last week with a, a virtual charrette and this, um, I, I would just love for you to share a little bit about how you made a virtual charrette will work. Um, we're really interested in enabling collaboration between a lot of our different software um, products. It's something we've invested a lot in and we're, we're just really curious how that went for you and I think that would uh, be interesting to the, the listeners as well. So for context, what my firm, uh, we do a lot of things but a lot, a big chunk of our work is bus network redesign studies yep. and these are very collaborative processes with multiple points of contact and one of the critical phases of these studies is when we actually hammer out a proposed network plan. And we always do this in a charrette. That is to say, um, we get key people out of the agency, key people from relevant adjacent agencies, such as the land use planners, the traffic engineers, um, sometimes the, the, the Department of Transport, the State Department of Transportation. And we get all those people in a room for all day for several days. And we, I have, um, I have all, we have all the data there. We have a mylar map stretched out and I'm drawing on it in colored pens and everybody is supposed to be watching and, and conveying views about whether we go left or right here, what this should do, what that should do. The goal of the charrette is that at the end of it, uh, everybody remembers how we got to that design even if they don't agree with every detail, but they remember and can explain it to other people in their offices. Um, and also, of course, so that we get the benefit of everybody's yeah. input as we're drawing. Now, um, the, it, it turned out to be um, um, doing all this as a Zoom meeting with everybody at home. Things I thought were hard were easy and things I thought would be easy were hard. Interesting. Um, the thing I thought would be hard would be replicating the experience of everybody looking at me drawing on a map. That turned out to be fairly straightforward. I, um, you know, my, my staff figured out how to hook a camera onto a desk lamp sitting above the map on my desk. We shrunk the map down so that it was much smaller than the one we'd have if we were on a conference table. And I drew on it and everyone could see me drawing on it. That was easy. Wow. Um, the hard part was attention, managing attention. Um, there's a tendency in a charrette for people who have been told to be there to be a little less engaged and to be looking at their phones and to be sort of wandering off. Mm. And um, the, the most unpleasant part of my job is keeping everybody focused. In big transit agencies, a common mistake that's made is that there's so much obsession with consensus and with inclusion that you just bring too many people to the charrette and many of them just don't care enough. And so, you know, they're off in their own worlds, they're chatting or whatever, and it becomes harder to maintain the intense focus on the thinking. That was harder. And it was harder because, and, and, and it was a, a, th a thing I would do differently now is to require everyone to have their video on and to require me to be able to see everybody's faces and require us to be able to see each other's faces. We had too many people on this charrette who had their video off and therefore I didn't really know they were there. Yeah. We didn't know they were there until we called on them and then sometimes they weren't there. And so um, in a charrette where the whole point is to maintain continuous intense attention so that everybody comes out really understanding what we did. Um, I, think, I think in the future, I'll have to insist that if you're there, you have to have your video on so that we are all seeing each other's faces and interacting that way. But that's really the only thing that, um, I mean, there are lots of things about, you know, not everybody has enough, you know, has good enough Wi-Fi at home and things like that. But um, 
you know, I think everybody's scrambling to fix those as fast as they can because we may be doing this for a while. I think there's an, a, a different related question, which is what happens to public outreach. And, you know, I hope you'll do one of these webinars with some transit public outreach experts because, you know, we're starting to think about this. I mean, our concern as a business right now, because we have to keep planning projects moving, is that all of our projects are basically going to stop where they get to the next point where we were going to do public outreach. Um, because, you know, the, and this is another teachable moment, the transit agents, the transit industry and FTA and its requirements are so set on the notion that public outreach means meetings. Yeah. And more and more public outreach is moving to the web anyway, is moving online anyway. Um, smartphone penetration is getting better and better. All sorts of innovation is going on around making um, web interfaces that are easier and easier to grapple with. Um, our friends at Trans Alliance in Miami, by the way, have done really great work on this. They came up with something that we will now use as a template. Oh. Um, and um, so, so this is an interesting moment. And I'm, I really want to see a lot of conversations about what happens to public outreach now and whether we can figure out how to get beyond uh, the meeting. Yeah. Um, because, you know, the meeting was always a problem. Very unrepresentative people come to it and come to a meeting. It's not a place to really hear from a cross section of the population. Um, but we also still need the ability to reach into um, uh, socially isolated communities um, and disadvantaged communities that aren't necessarily as plugged in. And, um, and we have to figure out how we do that now without being face to face. Yeah, um, I mean, I was just going to say, it's certainly, there have been ways I've been surprised at how, how much uh, virtually connecting on, on certain items has made it even easier and less of a barrier for me than attending meetings. And um, yeah, let's work on getting another webinar with uh, about engagement right now. I know Remix has invested in some new engagement tools as well, which maybe we'll add to the agenda on um, an upcoming webinar we have for uh, customers in, uh, in next, I think, Thursday, April 7th. Um, so before we uh, wrap up the Q and A, uh, sorry, the interview portion, I wanted to give you a chance to look beyond this crisis. Uh, so whenever this is over, will things go back to the way they were before, or what are some ways that this could just sort of change the role for, of transit forever? Um, when I look at how we come out of this, I anticipate that we've pro the industry has probably never faced a more critical storytelling challenge mm. about. Um, about why it exists, why it needs to continue to exist, why ridership fundamentally is not even the most important measure of its success in many places. And, um, and the reason for that is this. <clears throat> I expect transit ridership to come back very, very slowly. Um, we all know there's not going to be a day when the headlines say, this is over, go back to your lives as they were. There's going to be a day when the headlines say, okay, you can come out now, but be careful about this and this and this because the virus is still out there and it might come back again. Um, we know that's going to be the message when it comes. So I think everyone is going to still be spooked about the virus and that's still going to make them not want to use public transit, even as the city starts moving again. Probable outcome of that is that we'll get a lot of traffic congestion as, as everyone goes, tries to go back to driving because they're afraid of transit. Um, and um, we'll end up with lower transit ridership and therefore all of the social and environmental consequences of low transit ridership, congestion, um, emissions, and so on, um, losing out to the single occupant vehicle because that's where people feel secure. Um, that would seem to be an entirely logical path. And before long, you know, everyone, will, people will be out there saying, well, look, transit ridership just never came back from COVID-19. People just must be deciding that transit, it doesn't have a future, you know? They'll always be saying that. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and I think that's going to be a very perilous time because lots of people are going to be looking, who control transit budgets are going to be looking at ridership and say, well, you know, that's just not where it is anymore. But we all know the ultimate case for transit, real case for transit isn't measured by ridership. It's first of all, that it's an essential service and that it is foundational to other essential services because our essential services rely so much on low income people who can't all afford to have cars. And second, that in dense cities, it is indispensable as a means of sharing scarce space effectively. And the definition of a city is the shortage of space per person. Um, there's no getting around either of those things. And there are lots of people out there who have lots of, some of whom have lots of venture capital behind them, 
who are trying to tell a story about the depth of fixed rail transit. I think this has improved a lot. I think many of them have learned more since early in this decade when it got, when many of them were sounding quite triumphal. But, um, but I think that, you know, that battle is going to continue. And I think if transit agencies are fundamentally weakened by um, both budget, budgetary collapse that makes it difficult for them to get all their service back um, and by, you know, rhetoric that exploits the inevitably lower ridership of transit agencies to justify um, not investing in them. You know, that could be very dire. So it seems to me like we're heading into a point where it's really going to be all about the storytelling. It's really going to be all about the rhetoric. It's going to be about what story do we tell about ridership being down? And yes, of course, ridership is down. And in fact, the transit agencies were required to do things that kept ridership down. The transit agencies were required to do things like run more service than ridership justified. Uh, and they absolutely did, and they absolutely had to, be, and they should have because they're an essential service. How do we tell that story? How do we get the journalists off of ridership, ridership, ridership as being the only story? I think that's going to be essential to whether, whether and how quickly transit comes back. Fascinating. Um, and given that, I think there's a, let's start the Q&A. Um, James is asking, uh, perhaps there's an opportunity to seriously rethink and revisit baked assumptions about how we fund transit and rail, which I think would be an outcome of what you're saying. Um, and the metrics we use to measure budget performance and cost benefit. What are your thoughts on reimagining a funding regime that could be developed uh, and presented for consideration by policymakers? I'm not sure if this is totally in your wheelhouse, but I'd love to hear um, for your thoughts. Sure, it's very simple. Okay. I mean, where the money comes from, there are a bunch of different ways it can happen. Uh, I think we all know that we're, we're moving toward um, what I call decongestion pricing, pricing that wh whose effect is to, to reduce congestion by properly costing, by, by, by properly charging a market rent for space that your car is taking. Um, there's enormous revenue potential in that, and I think you're going to see more aggressive movement toward that, especially if we get a great wave of congestion as everybody tries to drive when they go back to work. Um, I also, so, so that's one thing, but I also think we have to be very clear that when we're looking at state budgets, we have to look at how we think about the highway department or the Department of Transportation, sorry, is, is what they're all called, but the, the, the highway department. And we have to look at the fact that highways, that, that the need for asphalt per capita goes up in rural areas and the need for transit per capita goes up in urban areas and we need to have a joint funding concept that properly captures the fact that cities need more transit per capita and rural areas need more asphalt per capita. And we can all have what we want, but insisting on the, there being a highway department over here and a transit agency over here and the funding coming from different places is not letting us think about that clearly. And that's ultimately going to be the path. Interesting. Um, we have a few questions about um, like backdoor boarding and fares that the fare changes that have happened because of COVID. Um, mm -hmm. This question from Daniel is in the long term, will this crisis encourage agencies uh, operating models to require fewer rider and employee interactions um, or proof of payment? Um, versus paying the near bus operator. Do you foresee that this will continue in the long term? Um, what are your thoughts? Again, I think we have to remember that this crisis is not going to end abruptly. It's going to fade away very gradually. So a lot of the fears that, that are now completely sort of correct and appropriate about personal interaction are not going to just end. People are going to continue to be motivated by them. Um, so I think that some of the concerns that have led to rear boarding uh, are probably still going to be there. Now, this ironically may push more agencies in directions that some of the best practiced agencies were already going in terms of all door boarding, uh, in terms of enabling people to board in the light at every door. Um, that, of course, means that people who are not paying cash fares uh, have to board through the front door, but everyone else can board through the back. And that, in turn, means more and more pressure, I think, to replace cash in fare collection. Um, which, uh, because I think cash in particular implies that very, very direct interaction. There are a whole bunch of other issues about fares that continue, that were there beforehand and are going to continue to exist. The, 
equity conversation about fares, um, the question about whether fair enforcement is even, you know, you know, it is credible uh, in all contexts, um, given uh, given the extraordinary difficulties that have been raised and given all the civil rights concerns that are, raised, that are rising around it, I think you'll continue to see arguments for free fares. And there are a whole bunch of problems with that when you look at, uh, especially in big agencies, how much of the revenue is free fares. Um, and then you have to calculate the cost of putting out additional service that's generated by that new demand. And you have to solve the roving homeless shelter problem. Um, you know, these problems were already there, and I think they're going to continue to be debated. Um, and and no, there's no question this crisis has kind of turned up the urgency on figuring these things out. Yeah, I'm seeing that's a really good point, and thank you for covering that in so many different um, angles. Um, I'm, I talk, speak a lot to the sort of um, large employers here in the Bay Area, um, and I know they're thinking about if this extends, how do we sort of allow some workers to go in some days and um, some other days? So this continuation of telework might be ongoing in the long term. Um, and we have a few questions about the impact on telework. And can we just get your thoughts on telework extending for the next 12 months and what that means for fixed route transit? I think a lot of people are going to decide that they like this and don't really want to go back. Um, uh, I'll be honest, I would love if the if virtual charrettes and virtual meetings became com everyone became comfortable enough with them that I was asked to travel less just for meetings. You know, that'd be wonderful. Yeah. Um, not good for the airlines, but great for the planet, you know, less emissions, all that. Uh, I think some of that will happen, and that's of course good for ultimate outcomes. I mean, there are, there are more important outcomes for our cities than just transit ridership. If overall travel goes down, that's good. Um, I think that we have a lot to figure out about telework. I'll make a pitch for one thing. I just realized over the weekend that by by sending all my employees home, I am I, I am making use of their personal space in ways that have impacts on their families and their pets, and that I should pay them rent for that, shouldn't I? Um, I've always, uh, we've always paid rent, rent for our own home office. I figured out over the weekend, wait a minute, I should pay all my employees a little bit of rent uh, for, you know, using their desks at home. And I hope other employees will think about doing that. Employers will think about doing that because I, I do think it's going to become more common. I think, um, I think that a lot of managers who have had a compulsive resistance to it are, are, are going to inevitably have figured out how to get past that resistance. I don't think the workplace is disappearing. I think we know that, you know, we do have to be, we do a lot of things better when we are in the same room. And I still think there'll be some of that. But I kind of hope that overall travel demand doesn't come back all the way to what it was. And you know what, particularly for us white collar workers who tend to be nine to five, because that, that massive peak commute is what is so expensive for transit agencies what is driving so much highway expansion. You know, even if we just flattened the peak a bit, you know, we'd have much better urban outcomes. And, and telework, even by white collar workers like most of us, could be a great way to do that. Yeah, absolutely. And as a follow up um, in terms of telework for our particular, uh, um, you know, industry, uh, there was a follow-up question on sort of what you saw in Miami, if you could give a little bit more details on sort of their approach. Um, and so something maybe we could take away from that. Um, I'm going to, um, I'm going to Google this right now and see if I can find it. Um, the, um, we're doing a thing there called the Better Bus Project. And um, I was just calling out the fact that they've done, I think, some really nice work on how they present the project to the public. Uh, although I, um, we're now at a stage where it's less unusual, but back when we were doing the alternatives, they did some really nice work on it. Basically, um, you know, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm, there are many advocacy organizations that I admire and foundations that I admire. Transit Alliance Miami is, is doing extraordinary work right now, particularly in that they have positioned themselves through their funding to be the actual client on a network redesign. We are working technically for them with Miami Day Transit as a, um, as obviously a central uh, centrally engaged stakeholder. Um, and so that's exciting too. But I, I, I want to encourage lots of, of creativity and innovation out there around how to tell the story with a website. Um, a lot of transit agency websites are not particularly, haven't particularly tried to do that yet. And I think we all have to do that now. Um, awesome. So uh, 
Bruce is asking about rural cities. So um, most of what we've been talking about applies to large operations in big cities. How would you address the issues for small, smaller rural transit agencies um, who might deal with less than 200,000 rides per year through all modes? I think in rural transit especially, you've got, we've got to be really, really clear that this isn't really about ridership. This is about essential service. This is about essential functioning. So in a rural region, there's one hospital and it's in the BC, right? <clears throat> and you're going to have to go there to use the hospital, but also you're going to have to go there to work in the hospital. And you're going to have to go there to go to the doctor. And how do people do that? And do you want people to be able to do that? Um, I think that um, I think that that's always been the story about rural transit, and that while it's natural that you want to cite ridership as as evidence that people appreciate you, as all social service agencies do, the libraries will tell you how many people visited the library this year. I think we also know that ultimately the value of the libraries is not measured by you know whether the number of people who visit them went up or down this year. It's about something more fundamental in terms of of what they mean for the community, what functions they perform, and so on. And so I think, you, I think again, this is just all about storytelling now. Uh, we, have an, we have an opportunity to tell a fundamentally different story about why we exist and, and, and what we're for. And, um, and, and I think, it's, I think it's, it's an exciting time for everyone. You know, I've always seen storytelling as sort of central to my work. It's an exciting time for everyone to really understand that that's that's the core of this now. It's what do we do with this new situation and what story do we tell about that? Yeah, and we heard that from Beth Osborne as well from Transportation for America that it was really having both the quantitative numbers from Transit Center to say this is how it's impacting transit as well as the stories from actual riders um, depending on transit to get to their essential job functions that really helped get that conversation going. Um, and she also mentioned capturing those stories of essential riders during this time to continue to highlight just how, uh, what a role transit is playing. Um, you had given three priorities for, uh, you know, considerations around reducing service. Um, and Erica Amador is asking, um, are those the same for small transit agencies or would you kind of tweak them differently for a smaller, more rural transit agency? With a rural transit agency, I think that we have to think clearly about what could people do without and still get where they're going. So one of the things that often comes up in rural transit is when you often a rural service, when it drives into a small city of five or 10,000, will drive all over the city, <laughs> right? It'll have a fixed route that drives all over the city and goes to the front door of every place that has any transit need. And, you know, sure, you're, you're still going to have to deal with the senior center, the hospital, things like that. But I think that we probably, we, I think we understand that the real place where rural transit is indispensable is in the links between towns, in getting people into their county seat, getting for the essential countywide services that only exist there, and for the jobs that only exist there. Um, and I think that in the rural work that we've done, um, we have seen a lot of agencies being interested in pushing back on the, on the expectation that when you drive from the county seat out to this town of 3,000 people, that you then drive all over it um, to, uh, to get you know, right in front of the door of anyone who might want it. That's not practical. Um, I think we're going to see more emergence of proper you know, transit centers and hubs and organizing those things. And then uh, ultimately, um, some of our rural towns, um, some of our rural cities have to also recognize it's the same conversation we have to have in, in urban areas too. Everybody's got to understand what the transit agency budget is and how far that can reasonably be expected to go so that people start to understand that there are probably transit problems that the transit agency can't solve. I would love to see rural transit agencies be able to specialize much more in the intertown links and you know, have cities, you know, have, have rural towns you know, start to do their own problem solving with volunteer drivers with kinds of things that are best assembled at that, um, at that kind of scale uh, to figure out how to do some of the local circulation needs. We, we, we've, we, for too many years, we've just said, oh, it's transit, therefore we should yell at the transit agency. That, that, that's not realistic anymore. Yeah. Um, I did want to tell everyone, uh, Jared's been really generous with his time and, and said we could extend till 11. So um, I'm going to run through a few more questions. Um, 
I know we really want to make sure that uh, you guys are connected with one another and with Jarrett. So we're going to keep going. So um, uh, this question is from Claudia um, at uh, uh, New York City Department of Transportation. And I think it might make sense as a question to the general audience. So if you have an answer for Claudia, um, drop it in the chat box. Um, but Jarrett, you might have some thoughts on this too, um, but no crush. Um, so besides New York City, is there any other city in the US putting measurements for cycling as an alternative in transportation for some communities as a resource? I think that that's outside my expertise, but I bet there are lots of answers in the chat. Exactly. Just wanted to get that answered in the yeah. chat. Okay. So how, um, and I should also mention that Jared's offered to answer some of these questions um, that we're recording in the chat box later. So if I don't get to your question, know that that's happening. Um, I'm trying to raise the fixed route transit questions here. Um, and again, if you have a question that goes to the audience and isn't about fixed route transit, feel free to drop that in the chat box and get answered by your peers. Um, oh, Okay, so, um, hmm. so how do we address the lingering negative perception and narrative that somehow density, i.e. good compact cities, is responsible for the transmission of the disease and virus? Yes, I, I think this is a great question, especially reading the news today. There were three deaths of MTA employees who are drivers on, or conductors on service. And I think there is this tension in narratives that's happening right now about transit and getting people around and, and any shared mode. How do we kind of address that or, or be watchdogs of that narrative? So this is where you've just prompted me to talk again about um, why everyone should hire literature and history students. Um, you <laughs> Someone's got to advocate for them. <laughs> read, well, no, no. You read a, because it is very helpful when you are encountering an issue to go back and look at how eternal this issue is. Mm -hmm. Because when an issue is eternal, it gives you some permission to deal with it being difficult. And it also gives you some historical perspective on it. Every plague in history has triggered a conversation about how awful and dangerous cities are. It just comes with the plague. Because yes, dense populations tend to be where it spreads first, and um, if you already have cultural hostility towards cities in the society, it will pick up on that. Um, for some reason though, after every plague in history, the city comes back. There is a reason for the city that the plague did not in any way erase. And, um, and that's the thing you have to remember, and that's why it's helpful to have some historians around who will remind you that you are in the presence of an eternal issue and that history tells us something about how that has worked out. So yeah, Joel Kotkin, for example, who has been arguing against cities for 30 years, you know, was in the Washington Post arguing against cities, um, like you expect. Um, he's not winning that argument though, and he still won't. I mean, I think we will have the emergence of secondary cities and that's great. But, you know, the idea that we're going to massively depopulate our dense cities uh, is ridiculous. It's not going to happen, uh, I think, in a big way because dense cities are just giving us too much of what we need. Yeah, um, this one's an interesting question. I'm not, uh, so do you have any recommendations for cities and regions that have multiple transit agencies? And you, know, you mentioned a lot of the connecting services and transfers. Uh, and if now is a good time for collaborative resource sharing, uh, they give the example of Los Angeles, but the Bay Area um, is another example of a place with a lot of different transit agencies. Well, it's probably a bad time to talk about collaborative resource sharing when absolutely everybody is in dire financial conditions. Nobody is quite sure who's, who should be sharing in that case. Mm. You know, it's terrible for all transit agencies right now. Um, you know, I think that, you know, where I have always been on multi-agency regions is that the key is not to merge them all. The key is to define, is to get a clearer definition of their roles and help them support each other by not duplicating each other. Um, but I think that, the, and I certainly think there is a crucial role for regional governments, metropolitan planning organizations in the United States, to be the place where the regional ask for help is organized. 
um, particularly where you've got lots of transit agencies in the region. And I especially think about places like the Bay Area, where many of the critical transit agencies are actually parts of city governments. Um, you know, they can't all be tromping to Washington on their own and finding those out. Yeah. Um, so let's do um, a question from Aaron, which is bus network redesign strike me as a planning effort that grew out of agencies responding to gradual evolutionary change with the capacity to take a look at in the long view. What are your thoughts on the fate of bus network redesigns um, on agencies that have seen this unprecedented demand and revenue shock? Will there be appetite for change in communities still reeling from unemployment and fear of shared vehicles? Um, if transit agencies have to downsize very suddenly and, con and continue to downsize for a while, that is going to create a network design problem, which I hope transit agencies recognize and choose to address. You can't just run Sunday services on weekdays forever. The Sunday schedules in many transit agencies are just not very functional. The frequencies are too low, the connections take too long. So if you're gonna run a Sunday service level, you better go in there and design it. And you know that's gonna be one of the pitches for network design work. Um, network design is not all forward look, and looks forward at various degrees. I like to say that a network redesign study is meant to be implemented in one or two years, but it's gonna have benefits that appear in five, 10, 15 years. And, it's also, and it also means there are things you need to do next week. It has impacts on a range of timescales. Um, but, and, so, and so that continues to be the case. Obviously, as a consulting business that does this, I am, like all of my peers, you know, alarmed at the prospect that planning work is going to stop for a while, or at least stop when it hits the next public outreach point, because no one knows how to do that, um, just because nobody has time to focus on it. But, um, but there is a new network design problem if, if transit has to come back and sustain for a long time a somewhat lower level of service. Um, and um, because, because you can't just run your Sunday schedule in the long run, you've got to go in and look at how that actually works and how to optimize that. That's great. All right, um, I'm gonna wrap up in these last six minutes um, and tell you about some resources um, we have coming up. So, um, oops. So um, we do have um, this upcoming webinar um, for, for Remix on April 7th. Um, so if you're a Remix customer or you've been interested in Remix, we did wanna let you know that we have some new features added for um, dealing with these kinds of changes. So we brought in hospital layers nationwide, um, as well as nursing homes. And we have this new tool tips function where you can see how many beds are in each place, um, not, available beds, but total number of beds. Um, we also have an upcoming, um, so that's available for everyone to join at remix.com backslash resources. Go ahead and sign up. Um, we have invited um, Stephanie and Ben from Transit Center to talk more. I saw there was some conversation in um, the chat box about um, Transit Center's research. Uh, we'll talk more with them then. Um, it seems like some of you will be very prepared. Um, and so I wanted to also direct those of you who don't know where Jared's blog is, um, it's at humantransit.org. Um, I also saw a lot of conversation about Transit App, um, and so their resources uh, link is listed here, as well as our, the fact that these webinars in our series will be recorded. Um, so they will be at remix.com backslash resources library, um, and then you can sign up for our future webinars um, that I mentioned at remix.com slash events. Um, I'm going to leave our contact information up here and maybe we'll answer one more question with the time that we have left. Does that sound good, Jared? Sounds good to me. Okay, so let's see. Um, Can I make one more pitch, by the way? Yes, please. Go to humantransit.org. Okay. Um, there's not just the recent content in time order. There's also on the, on the menu bar there, a, a category called basics. And those tend to be the essays that are most important to help somebody orient to transit issues and understand the context of things. That's not new. That's, you know, those are not news posts or current posts. They are timeless posts. Yes, and I think that may, speaks to your point about history, that some of these issues have been faced for a very long time and will serve us well to know. Um, all right, so 
There has been a lot of discussion around the long-term impacts of operations, but how might this impact capital projects? Do you think the $25 billion allocated by Congress will help offset the questionability of capital needs versus operational needs? Will there be a bigger push from Congress to increase capital funding to boost local economies? You know, this is another real teachable moment. It's a thinkable moment. Mm. Um, a lot of our transit policymakers are only interested in building things and they kind of understand the need for operations, but what really excites them is building things. And there's a lot of stuff we need to build. Um, and, and right now, the critical need to keep the society functioning is entirely operations. Um, and it's likely going into the future that again, if we see some societal shifts that reduce overall transportation demand, um, we may also be critically focused on operations for a while. Now, I'm not you know, certainly opposing a lot of the important transit capital projects that are out there, especially critical capacity projects in big cities. Um, but I think the starting assumption has, has been, it's understandably been right here at the, at the peak of the crisis, oh my God, we've got to keep these jobs moving. We've got to keep these contracts on schedule. We've got to keep this construction going. We've got to keep this project moving. Um, I think that over time, we're going to have to have some smarter conversations about which projects actually have to keep moving and which projects really can be slowed down and probably should be slowed down a little um, because we're going, because we are consciously or not making a decision between capital and operations at a time when operations is just critical. Mm. And so we have to be thinking about that. And, and again, I don't mean to imply that question is not easy. That question is very hard. The answer is different in different places for different projects. But it is a question we have to be asking ourselves. All right. Do you want to give any last, last minute, uh, any like last minute thoughts before we end? <laughs> no, Rachel, <laughs> I, I really appreciate your time and interest. It's been a great conversation. They've been great questions. I'll ask you the questions and if there's anything else that's in my, um, that I feel like I can say something useful about that I haven't said yet, I'll answer it there. Um, the blog humantransit.org and the basics post on that blog, the firm is Jarrett Walker, um, um, jarrettwalker.com. And um, again, I just really appreciate everyone's time and having a chance to talk with you today. Same, Jarrett. Thank you so much.